This video introduces the Harlem Renaissance and gene tumor. The Harlem Renaissance was a vibrant outpouring of black art that occurred in the United States starting around the 1910s into the 1930s and beyond. Some of the key literary writers associated with the Harlem Renaissance are the novelists Nella Larson and Zora Neale Hurston and the poets County Cullen and Langston Hughes. Some critics have wrongly perceived the Harlem Renaissance as disconnected from modernism. Such a view was based on offensive claims regarding the quote-unquote low aesthetic forms involved in Harlem Renaissance artistic productions and the quote-unquote high forms employed by white modernists like T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound. In fact, the participants in the Harlem Renaissance were well situated to respond to the failures of modernity, since, as works like Equiano's narrative attest, their own community had long experienced modernity's horrors and tragic errors of judgment. It's important to note as well that many notable figures in the Harlem Renaissance believed that a special talented tenth of the community would lead the rest of it forward. The idea of an elite and talented cohort of black artists reveals all the more how the Harlem Renaissance was a modernist phenomenon. The tremendous ambition of a white modernist like Yeats with his grand theory of history and gyres and his idea of a literary priesthood resonates with the Harlem Renaissance notion of the special skills possessed by a talented 10% who could understand the promise and failures of modernity more than ordinary people. The Harlem Renaissance contributed to the effort to empower African Americans in the U.S. by reaching out to at least two different audiences. On the one hand, the artistic productions of the Harlem Renaissance were intended to inspire, uplift, and unite African Americans who had long experienced unspeakable and debilitating racism. On the other hand, those artistic productions were intended to make clear the humanity of African Americans to other Americans and anyone else who thought otherwise. The very fact that the Harlem Renaissance, like Mary Wollstonecraft's treatise, involved claims regarding humanity, speaks to the enduring and oppressive power of Western social systems in their dualistic thinking. Indeed, attending the Harlem Renaissance were new assertions of black identity that defied and rejected such associations of African descent or black skin with subhumanity and subordination to white Europeans. Somewhat in the way that feminists put forth the new woman, participants in the Harlem Renaissance asserted the new Negro. Both identities involved ascribing humanity agency, and rights to persons who had long been deemed less than human. In the case of the Harlem Renaissance, writers staked out a claim for a vital, distinctive, and empowered new Negro self by merging elements of African American and European American cultural forms. Harlem Renaissance poems and novels combined elements of the African American experience, such as spirituals, slavery, the blues, jazz, and surviving elements of African culture with white majority cultural forms, like modernist literary innovations. Jean Toomer, like Yeats, stood at the vanguard of the Harlem Renaissance. Toomer was raised in Washington, D.C. by his single mother and in the household of his grandfather, Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback, who was the first black U.S. governor, having served as acting governor of Louisiana during the Reconstruction era. Toomer's life witnesses an experience of in-betweenness rather than of firm identifications. For example, he was raised in an elite household in white D.C. neighborhoods, but attended 
an all-black high school, and while on his marriage certificates to two white women, he's listed as white. His draft registration lists him as black. Only in 1921, at the age of 27, would Toomer experience himself as a categorically black man when he moved south to Georgia to work as the head of an all-black agricultural college. Toomer was immediately drawn to the lives of the rural black community, writing that, a deep part of my nature, a part that I had repressed, sprang suddenly to life and responded to them. Toomer's masterwork, Cain, published in 1923, reflects his inspiration by the lives of black people in the rural South. In keeping with Toomer's hybrid and shifting identity, his relation to the Harlem Renaissance is complex. Cain is often viewed as one of the first works of the Harlem Renaissance and the New Negro Movement, but Toomer wrote Cain in Washington, D.C., and he resisted identification with a single movement. And over the course of his life, he had little interaction with Harlem Black literary circles. Regardless of Toomer's relation to a Black cultural outpouring based in Harlem, Cain is very much a modernist work. Part prose, part drama, part visual art, and part poetry, Cain is an artistic collage or montage. It is organized into three sections, each of which is preceded by the visual image of an arc. Thematically, it engages with an African-American community in flux and in transition. Part one focuses on African-American life in the rural South. Part two responds to the great migration of African-Americans from the rural South to the urban North, a movement that was mobilized by the racism of the Jim Crow South and which drew black artists to New York and the neighborhood of Harlem. Toomer addresses life for African Americans in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, and stresses the challenges facing the new black arrivals as they negotiate city life. The final section of Cain is a quasi-autobiographical drama short story hybrid that tells the tale of a fair-skinned black man from the North who works as a teacher in a Southern rural school. Such aspects of Cain as its fragmented generic organization and its representation of the spatial dislocation of black people speak to Toomer's identity as a modernist and resonate with Yeats's emphasis on a society where things fall apart. We'll take a closer look at some of the poetry in Cain in the next video.